and uh, welcome everyone to the ISBTT. I'm uh, John de Zulueta, a member of the board of the Círculo de Empresarios, and I was recruited to this job because I speak English. <laughs> I, uh, the ISBTT is the, is the international summit, and actually this is the 29th international summit of the business think tanks. Uh, and I think we should call it the RISBTT, the, the Royal uh, International Summit of Business Think Tanks, because we have the honor of His Majesty the King here with us this morning. Uh, and we had, of course, his parents at the, at the dinner last night, for which we, we also thank them. Uh, we also have here with us the Minister Luis de Guindos, Minister of the Economy, Industry and Competitiveness, who will close the session at the end of the afternoon. So please stay for the full day and I, I urge everyone to stay in the afternoon where we have some very, very strong panels uh, dealing with things like education and we have the Director General of education from Finland, where we can, I think we can all learn a lot. And we also have uh, a leader in, in globalization, which is the final panel of the four panels. Uh, now, the first thing I've always learned is uh, thank the sponsors. And we have a, a long list here of sponsors, Deloitte, uh, which everybody knows, El País, the leading newspaper in Spain, Telefónica, we thank them very much for the use of their auditorium, and their chief executive, uh, Jose, Jose Maria Álvarez Payete, will be the, will deliver the keynote address after the king speaks. Aon, Atlantic Copper, Management Solutions, which is a consulting group, Natixix, Financial Services, Philips, which we all know, and Santander Bank. Now, the reason for this meeting and what we've been really working on in the Círculo de Empresarios for the past uh, year and a half now is the where is the world going to be in the year 2030? And we all have a responsibility, I think, to, to make this a better place to live in, for ourselves, for our children, and I think we have an individual responsibility and also a group responsibility in terms of our companies. This summit, I should say, is being held in, in the summit of Madrid. This Telefonica has picked the highest geographical point of the city of Madrid to build their campus. And so we are in the top, top of Madrid for, for this summit. We're trying to create a more inclusive and sustainable capitalism. And, and in the past year and a half that we've been working on this theme, uh, a lot of things have, have happened in, in the world. I think the, I'm, I'm happy to say that from the economists that I've spoken to this morning here, over coffee is that there seems to be optimism in the world. It seems to be that after 10 years or nine years of economic crisis, we seem to be coming out of the crisis. Spain certainly is predicting a GDP growth of over 3% this year. Uh, but it also seems like a lot of people have been left behind which has led to populism, which has led to things like Brexit, the election of Trump, the strength of Marie Le Pen in France, and the strength, of course, of the alternative for Germany in Sunday's elections. So I think the more inclusive capitalism is, is a real challenge. And of course, we have Piketty's study about the increase of uh, the disproportionate increase and the distance between the rich and the poor, 
which seems to be getting greater according to his study. And then, of course, we have the factors of globalization and the impact on the different societies. So there's a, lo there's a lot going on, and I think we're, we'll have some very strong panels covering this. The, the first panel of the day is 2030, sort of the overview. My background in the past 20 years has been healthcare, and of course, the aging society in, in the European nations is a, is a big issue. But for 2030, we have then broken it down into some specific areas, and the, and the, and the second panel uh, will cover the whole question of digital, the digital world. And then the, the third panel is education, which I think, of course, is, is very important. And maybe we can learn from Finland there. And then the fourth one is globalization. And we have uh, one, of, one of the leaders, Professor Gamowat from uh, NYU, uh, who, is, who heads up the, the Global Institute there in the Stern School of Business. And he's, of course, a very controversial professor because he says globalization is going very slowly, whereas other people are saying globalization is going very rapidly. Uh, now, one thing that's important uh, in terms of the world in 2030 is that there, we're going to be more than eight and a half billion people, and there are going to be more than 40 cities with more than 10 million people. And most of those cities are going to be in the developing world, so we're going to see a, a, a real sea change in terms of the shift of power and balance, the strength, obviously, of, of China, the growth of Africa, uh, and really Europe and the U.S. and what is currently the leading nations in the developed world are going to have to face this change and well, you know, what does all this mean uh, for all of us. Uh, I'm very happy that a lot of people have come from a lot of different countries here today and, and the ISBTT really is an international group of think tanks like the Círculo de Empresarios in uh, Madrid but all over the world and we're very honored to have the three top people from the conference board in the United States here. Uh, we also have people from the CES IFO in Germany, CA of Croatia, the SMO of Holland, l'Institut de l'Entreprise in France, uh, the EVA from Finland, the Forum of Administradores de Empresas for Portugal, the CED the U.S., which is now folded into the conference board, the CIRD from China, the Kazai Dayukai from Japan, the CEAL from Latin America, the CEDA from Australia, and I remember years ago we all went from the Theoretical Empresarios to Australia for the summit, the HBI from South Africa, and the IA. CEO from Tunisia. So it's a very big network of international think tanks, and hopefully all of this global thinking can lead to more prosperity in the world, a more inclusive uh, society, uh, and greater economic development. We. Uh, Certainly would like to thank His Majesty the King for attending here. His Majesty has been very supportive of business in Spain. In fact, just yesterday he was in Palma de Mallorca promoting tourism, uh, which is of course one of the leading industrial sectors here. We also have had the rec recuperation of the construction sector and those and the increase in exports. And so those three factors have really propelled Spain out of the, the years of crisis. So the first person I would like to introduce to speak here today is the president of the Círculo de Empresarios, 
Javier Vega de Seoane, who's an engineer, who's had a brilliant business career. Back in 1988, he was on, when I was running Schweppes, he was on our board. So he has a, a long track of success in business. He spent many years in the, in, when the government had the ENI and ran a whole series of state-run companies. He was a major figure there. He was a major figure in Air Cross in Barcelona. He is now chairman of uh, DKV or DKV, as the Germans say, insurance. Uh, he's also involved in the advisory board of Fujitsu. So please welcome Javier Vega de Seuane. Thank you, John. I, th I hope that from this part of uh, Madrid, we will be able to have a long-range view and then find out where, what is the path we have to follow. Thank you. Your Majesty, Minister of Economy and Competitiveness, authorities, fellow organizations, friends. Firstly, I'd like to thank Your Majesty for having accepted our invitation to preside over the inauguration of the 29th International Summit of Business Think Tanks. Allow me also to welcome delegates of a variety of business organizations from all over the world, all members of the International Network of Business Think Tanks. I'd also like to take this opportunity to remind you that Círculo de Empresarios, which is celebrating its 40th anniversary, contributed more than 30 years ago to launch of this summit for business think tanks, and that this is the fourth time we have celebrated our international summit here in Madrid. We have therefore a veteran organization which says a lot about the consolidation of this international co collaborative project uh, comprised of organizations from civil society. And with this in mind, I would like to thank Lucila Gomez Baeza for her personal involvement in the initial launch of this global network. Lucila? Lucila is not here. <laughs> His spirit is with us. Of course, it goes without saying that I would also like to thank the summit sponsors, Deloitte, El País, and Telefónica, whose premises we are using. Thanks, uh, President Jose Maria Álvarez Payete. Many thanks. As well as the other patrons, Atlantic Copper, Aeon, Management Solutions, Natixis, Philips, and Grupo Santander. In the title of the summit is reflective of the concerns we all have. The world in 2030 towards inclusive and sustainable capitalism. If there is one lesson we have learned from the recent economic downturn is that capitalism, which has so far shown that is the only economic model with a capacity to generate wealth and progress, should be both sustainable and inclusive. Or it will not com complete its primary task. And if it fails to do this, it may be called into question, as already is happening. Any successful model, economic, political, or social, has to be based on freedom, a concept which has been at the forefront of Circulo's philosophy right from the beginning of its foundation. But we also need justice to ensure that one person's freedom doesn't impose on another's and that growth generated through everyone's hard work is shared out equally. Recovery from the Great Recession of 2008 should provide opportunities to all citizens, but especially to those weakest and most disadvantaged. While this is uh, still pending, we cannot talk about recovery or feel that we have accomplished our task. 
That is the great challenge facing all of us that we are going to reflect on today with the assistance of leading figures who I'm sure will provide us with their own personal thoughts on the topic. To all of you, I would like to thank you for your presence here today and the valuable contribution that without a doubt you are going to make. As president of a business think tank that has just celebrated its first four decades of activity, I would like also to say that with the current process of transformation of the world today, both civil society and business world need to take a more active role in finding solutions to the problems that affect society in general. Companies have to put their capabilities at the service of countries to solve or mitigate complex issues and we should do this in close collaboration with public powers. Business responsibility strategies should gradually permeate the business community in the benefit of society as a whole. Today, where the whole world is experiencing a rapid disruptive transformation process, Circulo de Empresarios, whose slogan is Ideas for Growth, is concentrating its capacity around three areas. Growth, institutional quality, and business responsibility. All this requires a stable framework that currently is being called into question on a local and global level by populism and obsolete nationalisms that seem to be unaware that the world has changed. Yesterday, Circulo de Empresarios, on the occasion of, of its 40th anniversary, officially presented the document, A Better Spain for Everyone. The purpose is to contribute to a national debate with the aim of developing a country project that we can all support and that will help us to recover the climate that we have lived through in recent times such as the political transition or our entry into the European Union. Our dear friend and member of the Circulos Advisory Board, Jose Maria Pérez Perides, has expressed the main concept of this project into the video that we will now show you. Please. España tiene un próspero futuro a su alcance, por su gran variedad geográfica y cultural, por su larga historia y por su enorme potencial. Democracy has brought us peace, freedom, stability and prosperity. With dialogue and consensus, agreements have been reached that have benefited all. In times of globalization, we need to put together our talent and innovation. Education, inequality, and ongoing training will guarantee equal opportunity. We need well prepared teams to achieve our ambitious goals. Mm -hmm. 
each generation has to help the next generation to develop. Sustainable growth with quality employment will guarantee the welfare state. It is essential to efficiently combat corruption and the black market. We're all responsible for achieving a better Spain in all aspects. Thank you, Peridis. He did a very good job, according to our opinion. Then solutions uh, to these problems have to come about, as they always have done through dialogue, consensus, as the goodwill of those who take part, government, political parties, institutions, business people, trade unions, workers, and civil society in general. And this attitude that we should all adopt, and which has the key to our transition to a democracy four decades ago, can be summarized through a recent suggestion by His Majesty, the King of Spain, which I would like to quote, let's shake hands and not turn our backs on each other. And that, my friends, is the task we have ahead. Many thanks to all of you. And now, His Majesty the King will take the floor. His Majesty the King will say a few words to us. Good morning. Ministry of Economy and Competitiveness, President of the Circle of Businessmen, our host, the President of Telefonica, thank you very much for hosting us today. Authorities, speakers, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank you for this invitation today. Uh, which follows on a previous invitation I would also want to thank, and that's uh, your invitation last night to my parents, the King and Queen Juan Carlos and Sofia, to your gala dinner celebrating that wonderful birthday. Uh, I appreciate very much that uh, gesture. And when you're celebrating 40 years, of course, uh, he has played such a central part in those 40 years that I really appreciate your uh, asking him to join you in that uh, celebration last night. Thank you so much. And uh, continuing on this mention of the 20, uh, 40th anniversary, I would like to take this opportunity to um, wish you a happy birthday, to um, congratulate all of you in the Circulo Empresarios for these 40 years of life and of uh, productive and useful activity. 
It's certainly a good age in the human scale, a very productive age. Um, uh, but for all of us in Spain, as I started to mention in another way, um, it, it means much more, uh, especially to, to all of those above mid-40s, which that would make uh, most of us in this hall. The reason I say this is, of course, because during this period, uh, the last 40 years of Spain's history, mark a unique and successful chapter of a society that has truly transformed itself in, uh, in all senses. And uh, I'm not going to dwell on all that. We, we know uh, most of it, and uh, we mention it very often. But um, democratic and institutional governance, economic development, social security and public health care, education, promotion of science, free and open markets, international presence in the business world that more uh, affects you this morning, but also in many other aspects like the joining of the EU, uh, then economic community, joining NATO, and being part of the international community at a, at a very large and broad scale. And in all that story of success, with all its ups and downs, of course, and with all the remaining challenges that we need to deal, to deal with, civil society institutions have indeed played a fundamental role. Within that role, Circulo Empresarios uh, should rightly be proud in claiming it has exercised the leading part in analyzing and forecasting problems with an independent stance or in proposing useful ideas for our country's progress and modernization. By speaking up learned and qualified opinions on many matters of public interest, especially but not exclusively related to the economy. In this regard, the Circula is a good example of how important it is for society through, this, the, uh, through the institutions representing different uh, sectors to commit to the, the defense of its values and to the public interest. Indeed, the Circulo has contributed to a dynamic debate on issues that concern our society, such as education, health care, pensions, public deficit. Moreover, it tackles issues more directly related to the business world such as the need to increase the size of our companies, which is one of the safest roads to job recovery and consolidation, and generally to economic growth, or also the regulatory framework for corporate and or market development, also issues related to our partnership in the European Union, to banking and finance, to international trade and investments, and so on and so on. Promoting debate is indeed one of the Circulo's essential contributions since the exchange of ideas contributes to enrich our approach to these important issues and reach solutions to the problems addressed. The response we give to these questions will determine the health of our welfare state, a basic element in the stability and progress of our democracy. The Circula has also played a key part in structuring civil society, developing collaboration initiatives with other associations and entities to better defend their shared principles and to the benefit of society as a whole. An example of these initiatives is precisely today's summit. This is the venue for spreading the Circula's ideas beyond our borders in a world that should aspire to be increasingly united. And since I'm here mostly not to speak, but to listen and to learn as well, I think we all should never stop learning. Um, I won't uh, continue occupying more of your precious time, but I will remain with you to uh, listen. Unfortunately, I won't be able to do that the whole day, but um, I will pick on Javier uh, for uh, some brief reports on everything that you have been discussing today. 
we're going to have the opportunity and the privilege to listen to what I am sure will be some very interesting reflections coming from a group of highly prestigious uh, personalities regarding the challenges posed to us by the still ongoing and deepening globalization. I won't say if it's a uh, fast or a slow process, but it certainly has been going on for centuries. Um, and the more recent complex and accelerated influence of precisely the digital economy uh, that pertains so much to what this company is about and its mobility. One of the more clear and extended effects of innovation today. Of course, there are many more embedded issues, themes, challenges uh, in these broad concepts of modern trends. Uh, you mentioned some, uh, John, the shift of gravity, of geostrategic gravity, um, the, the environment challenges, global climate change, the migrations, and all those enormous challenging trends of today have, of course, their economic impact. But those two broad issues, globalization and digital economy, are already having a present and daily impact uh, and profound impact on two aspects that are critical for us, employment and education. If we can address them appropriately, we will certainly be able to advance towards the broad and long-term objective, which is a more inclusive and sustainable economic system. The crisis of these past years has placed us in an unsecure and unstable world, one with marked new social divides, a world that is facing major threats and uncertainties. I'm sure that uh, joint reflection, that the, the, the debate such as this morning, the exchange of ideas, and as I pointed out, will help, certainly will help, help us find, among all of us, solutions to those major challenges. Uh, as I said, I won't continue occupying your time, but I certainly thank you for this opportunity. I congratulate you for maintaining this uh, flame of uh, deep thought, of generous thought uh, about our problems, our trends, and uh, to be able to face a better world tomorrow for future generations. With my best wishes for your every success at this event and also your long-term aspirations, it is now my honor to hereby declare open this 29th summit, international summit, I won't add the R in front of it, of uh, business think tanks. Uh, all the best to you and thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Your Majesty, for those words and in inaugurating our summit. Uh, now we move on to the new CEO. Well, he was named CEO uh, of Telefonica last year. Uh, Jose Maria Alvarez Payete will deliver a brief uh, keynote address. Your Majesty, Minister of Economy, Industry and Competitiveness, Presidente del Círculo de Empresarios, rest of authorities, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you all. Your Majesty, let me convey to you my sincere appreciation for your presence here today and for presiding over this remarkable event. Thanks to John de Zulueta and Javier Vega de Fesione for the introduction and welcome. For us, 
at Telefonica. It is a deep honor and a great pleasure to host the 29th edition of the International Summit of Business Think Tanks at Distrito Telefonica. Thank you all for being here. I would like to take the opportunity that Circulo de Empresarios has offered me to hold the stage today to congratulate them for their outstanding work throughout four decades of history. The role in favor of Spanish businesses and promoting the economic development of our country has undoubtedly been essential for the Spanish economy. The Circulo de Empresarios has invited us to share our views on what will be the world in 2030 towards inclusive and sustainable capitalism. The relevance of the topic together with the contribution from outstanding players from the economic, business, political and social scenes are certainly going to make a huge success out of this event. In this good company, I feel privileged to have the opportunity to share our vision on such an appealing subject. What will be the world? What will be the future roughly 15 years from now? Let me start by telling you we are living a unique moment. Never in the history of humankind we have enjoyed such an amount of technology as we do today. This is deeply related to Moore's law formulated more than 50 years ago. It predicts that every 18 months the processing power of a chip would double at the same time its price would halve. The explosion of technology made possible by Moore's law is at the root of the digital revolution, whose impact so far could well be four times larger than that from the Industrial Revolution. Digitalization is stimulating and facilitating transformation across every sector by improving customer satisfaction, driving optimization, nurturing new revenue streams, and developing new business models. This is why digitalization has led to an increase in almost 50% in productivity and accounted for between 15 and 30% of job creation in recent years in the world. In the 21st century, the rich countries will be those that are capable of facing the challenges and capturing the opportunities related to digitalization. Far from decelerating, we should expect further technological disruption and digitalization across every sector and industry to be one of the global trends determining future as well as current challenges and opportunities. It all started in the 90s with the advent of the internet and grew thanks to the explosion of connectivity, the spread of smartphones and the rise in information storage and processing capabilities. Today, we want to be connected 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Each of us, in countries such as Spain, we spend an average of almost three hours per day connected through our smartphones. We interact with each other and remain in contact and share information in social networks. We do our shopping in the internet. We benefit from access to the best doctors and their finest medical knowledge with telehealth, big data, and cognitive systems. We can 3D print a bridge, a house, a mill, or even a human organ. Facial recognition speeds up airport lines, and our digital fingerprints are the new keys to our homes and valuables. We study and travel with virtual and augmented reality. We manage smart homes with a simple click or with our voice. We monitor crops remotely with drones. Industries are optimized with robots and interconnected sensors. I'm not talking about a future remote or remote future. This is already happening today, and this is just the beginning. All of this is possible thanks to unprecedented connectivity achieved through fiber, cable, VDSL, and 4G networks deployment. On top of this, video, security, Internet of Things, and cloud services introduce new functionalities to improve the customer experience. But we already envision 5G will be a real revolution. A speed connection will be 100 times faster than today, with latency five times less than what we enjoy today. 
data volumes and the number of interconnected devices will grow by a thousand times. Virtualization will enable network capabilities based on software instead of traditional configurations based on hardware. These new programmable, programmable capabilities will improve and optimize network management. Then, on top of all this amazing technology, we have seen the arrival of artificial intelligence. Not so long ago, this appeared to be just too futuristic. However, the development of underlying technologies such as augmented and virtual reality, language recognition, and machine learning algorithms is making it very real. Investment in artificial intelligence is actually growing at a high rate. In 2016, companies invested in it between 26 and $39 billion. And analysts expect global GDP will be four time times higher in 2030 due to the impact of artificial intelligence. This is the equivalent to $16 trillion of wealth creation. This is more than the current output of China and India combined. Such focus certainly makes artificial intelligence a remarkable prospect in today's fast-changing economy. Furthermore, the intelligent use of the information generated by the connected devices will facilitate finding a solution for global challenges. This is why artificial intelligence and cognitive intelligence are so relevant for all of us. To be able to grab this opportunity and those emerging around us at amazing speed, we need to be open-minded and, and ready to be transformed. Let me tell you a little bit about your own, our own experience at Telefonica and about how we decided to face one of the largest and deepest transformation in the industry. We have around 100 years of history. Our company was not born digital. And to adapt ourselves to the new digital environment is not a minor challenge for us. We embraced the concept of digitalization as early as in, 2000, in 2011, as we believe we are on the right path. In line with this decision, we have invested as much as 50 billion euros since 2012 to become what we call a platform company, with data, with data as the new enabler for a new Telefonica. This vision allows us to claim an amazing new option, the opportunity to use cognitive power to become a key player in our customers' lives. We want our customer to feel that the network belongs to them and gives them a differential value towards a radical change in the relationship model with our customers. Moreover, we decided to do it guided by clear principles of privacy regarding the use of data, and those are security, transparency, and control. This is a huge step. This is why we are adding artificial intelligence and cognitive systems, a state-of-the-art technology in the capabilities of our network. I am deeply convinced that the impact from cognitive intelligence will be comparable in the near future to the one realized from mobile technology or broadband. All in all, there is no doubt we are living a vertiginous wave of disruption and spread of technology. As a result, we have reached levels of economic development and welfare never seen before, and we should expect this to go on. Technology emerges as the engine for democratization, progress, and well-being. 20% of global population does not have the technical possibility to access the network. Connecting the unconnected, for example, should provide access to millions of people to the opportunities of technology. Reducing the digital divide beyond connectivity, it means encouraging digital skills and education, starting with ESTM, that is with science, technology, engineering, and maths. At the same time, Academic training of new digital profiles that will arise in every professional area should be a priority for all of us. And let us not forget the social sciences we, we shall also need to help build this new world. Digital education is a very effective tool to reduce the digital divide 
and set the foundations to sustainable growth. And this is everyone's responsibility. At the same time, technology sets ethical debates, particularly around data. Who does data belong to? Where is the boundary between privacy and freedom? We are really crossing uncharted territory. Looking ahead, we should ask ourselves what world do we want to build and whether we are going, we are doing help us move along this desired path. Because sustainability can only be achieved if we ensure a fair distribution of wealth and opportunities. New policies may be required for this new world in areas such as education or taxes. We have reasons to believe a brilliant future is ahead of all of us. But only with values that guide us can we capture the full potential of technology to build a better and fairer society. We should all contribute to forming a better, more equitable world, participating actively in the construction of a new digital society. The future really belongs to everyone. It is everyone's responsibility as well. Let us all be there. Thank you very much. Well, now we start with the uh, first one-hour panel. Um, and this is the focus, of course, on the world in 2030, 13 years from now. The moderator is Tom Burns, the journalist. He spent many years as the correspondent of the Financial Times. Tom, one of the people here today, said you are the Martin Wolf of Spanish journalism. He writes twice a week a column in Expansion Business magazine, very knowledgeable. His panel has a lot of interesting people whom he will introduce. And Tom has what very few people have, which is the Oxford background and the Spanish background. And I think this panel will be very, very interesting. And eh, Tom? John, thank you. Thank you. We're going to have to cut back a bit because we're already running 15, 15 minutes over. Right. Uh, is this working? Yes. Magista. Uh, Chairman of the Circle Empresarios, Chairman of Telefonica. Uh, this is the first panel, uh, as John was saying. I was thinking that you know we've got to sort of set the picture with this challenges of 2030. And there's a wonderful story of two of my countrymen, uh, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, who went on a holiday and they, it was a camping holiday, and on the first night, in the middle of the night, or some point, Holmes banged Dr. Watson with his elbow and said, Dr. Watson, look up, and what do you deduce? And Watson said, Mr. Holmes, I deduce that we are, from an astrological point of view, we are part of a huge solar system. From a temporal point of view, I deduce that it will soon be day. And from a climate point of view, looking at all these stars, I deduce that it's going to be a very fine day. 
And he said, Mr. Holmes, what do you deduce? And he said, Dr. Watson, I deduce you're a blithering idiot. Someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> <laughs> I tell the story because what I'm going to ask Bart to do, <clears throat> uh, sorry, our distinguished uh, main speaker, Bart Van Ack of the Conference Board, Chief Economist, Chief Strategic Officer, <coughs> Vice President, will introduce the debate about the tent. The tent keeping this tent going until 2030. And then I've got Igmar of the Circulo Empresarios, uh, Jose Juan Ruiz and Ahmed, who will then comment. And we're going to be very disciplined with our timing. So at 11 o'clock, we can have our coffee break. But you have the floor. Your Majesty, Ministry of Economy, Industry and Competitiveness, dear participants. Uh, let me join with previous speakers to congratulate this time on behalf of the Conference Board uh, Circular de Empresarios with their 40th anniversary. And also with organizing this 29th summit of the International Network of Business Think Tanks, which I think already will go down in history as the summit of summits. So uh, this is certainly a, a good moment to look forward. Um, and luckily, even though you're 40 years old, you haven't given us the task to look 40 years ahead, but only to look about 13 years ahead. And to be honest, as an economist, to look forward, that frankly is far enough out. Looking 40 year, 13 years ahead also begs the question to look 13 years back. And when we actually do that, it is actually surprising looking at some of the economic indicators, how well the global economy as a whole has come out as what economically has been one of the most volatile decades of the past century. We went through a lot since 2004, notably of course the global financial crisis and the way this has impacted our economies. But strikingly, the global economy has still been doing surprisingly well. Average growth of GDP per capita in the last 13 years was even somewhat faster than it was in the 13 years before 2004. Much of that is due to faster emerging market growth, but there's an upside to that, and that is that millions of people were taken out of poverty. World population and labor, force, uh, labor supply has weakened as a result of aging, but productivity growth has remained decent and at least made up for it to some extent. Technology and digitization, as we have already heard, has been accelerating hugely, and we've had remarkable achievements to improve the quality of life through reduction of poverty and CO2 emissions. That, of course, is not meant to say that everybody has benefited equally, something to which I will return, but it is important to say up front that at the most aggregate level for the global economy, we have actually come out surprisingly well. Where this is going next is very uncertain. GDP per capita, according to the most measures, is not likely to accelerate much in the coming 13 years. The share of mature economies will continue to decline. Aging will cause further slowdown of population and labor force growth. And productivity growth will heavily depend on our ability to make our technologies, as has been described so well in the, by the previous speaker, will indeed turn themselves into faster productivity growth. And we need to put in everything if we want to further reduce poverty and manage climate change. Now, to make sense out of all that is happening, it is useful to divide the economy into three main buckets. Shocks, trend, and disruptions. To paraphrase Henry Kissinger, who said at some point, shocks is about the imminent, the immediate, that is taking up our, our time and our minds and needs to redress right away. Trends is about the long term. It's about those things that are not changing so quickly. And disruptions, they are about the important, because they are the things that could potentially change that trend to the upside or to the downside. Business leaders and policymakers will need to pay attention to all three of those aspects of the global economy. Now, short-term shocks and uncertainties can overtake our mind and distract our focus, and we have seen a lot of that over the past, uh, over the past 13 years, and Spain, of course, certainly has had its share of that. What these shocks typically do is that businesses tend to become a bit more risk averse and slow down on investment as a key driver of economic growth. 
And indeed, when you look at some of the indicators, economic policy uncertainty, which you see on the left-hand side of this chart, has leveled up quite a bit since, 2000 and, uh, since 2007, since the crisis. And business confidence um, has, been, uh, um, uh, has been very volatile, but recently has picked up a fair bit, which is good news because we have indeed seen businesses picking up on investment in the US, in Europe, and in many other mature and emerging markets. So might this perhaps be a tipping point? And will the global economy roar back to the growth rates of the 1990s and 2000s? And may economists perhaps be a little bit too pessimistic on where we're heading? Now, for the optimists, the class may be half full. Concerns about slow demand and slow consumer growth or weak investment have disappeared to the background. But pessimists are saying not so fast. We're still seeing interest rates and inflation to be unusually low, and monetary authorities will struggle to reduce balance sheets and raise rates in what's still a fairly um, fragile recovery. Moreover, low inflation and low interest rates may be more stubborn than we think. Supply-related costs, notably the already mentioned aging of the labor force, will create an enormous drag on government debt and personal finances. And despite all the technology and digital transformation innovation, the slow pace of investment of recent years hasn't really helped much to speed up productivity yet. I wish I would have the time to explain in detail what you're seeing in this chart, but in order to stay with our plan to stay on time, let me just say you there are two important things to see here. First of all, the growth of working age population, which is the, the reservoir of labor supply for the next 30 years, is beginning to slow and will continue to slow further across mature economies and increasingly emerging markets. And productivity growth, as I already mentioned on the right-hand side here, has slowed down, not only in mature economies, but even in emerging markets. And indeed, when we're looking at our projections, looking out five years and ten years, the numbers aren't incredibly optimistic. Mature economies will gradually begin to see their economies slow down to less than 2% in the next decade. And even emerging markets, even though they will continue to grow uh, faster and perform much better, their own growth rates will also become somewhat slower. As these economies get richer, it is just harder to continue to grow as rapidly. Most notably, that is visible in China, where the combination of slower labor supply and slow productivity growth may gradually cause GDP to drop to below 4% into the next decade. Now, these models are worth for what you put into it. They are based on what we think we can reasonably assume, but they cannot allow for the fundamental shifts and disruptions I would want to spend a few minutes on right now. I could extend this list very well into many slides, and I'm sure that during our discussion in the panel, as well as during the day, we'll talk about multiple disruptions. But here are four or five of the ones that I think are really important. First, the rapid decline in oil prices and the prices in energy and commodity markets more broadly since 2014 and the subsequent modest recovery has multiple causes. While slow demand in the global economy hasn't helped those prices, rapid changes on the supply side, for example the rise of the oil and gas fracking industry in the United States, or the weaker market power for OPEC and non-OPEC countries is going to play into the future of our energy world. Many governments have now committed to significant CO2 reductions, most governments, we should actually say, and there will therefore be an important role for new technologies that increase energy efficiency and promote the creation of a circular economy that maximizes the reuse of resources in production and consumption. Also in the past decade, we have seen a dramatic decline in the growth of global trade. The slowdown in demand and GDP has again been a major cause of that, and it is now beginning to provide a tailwind, and we are beginning to see trade recover somewhat. But there are also some structural changes in the global economy, such as, for example, a shift towards consuming more services, which are less tradable. And we see a consolidation in many global supply chains as emerging markets add more value to those global supply chains. And technology reshoring of manufacturing activity just requires less shipping of components, intermediate components around the world. 
And then, of course, there is the concern about a rise in protectionism that favors domestic interests more than the advantages that we can get from global trade. Fourth, there is the rise of what may be called the new digital economy, which involves the combination of mobile technology, ubiquitous access to the internet, and the move towards cloud storage and computing. This has created tremendous advantages to consumers. However, businesses are often still struggling to deal with those new technologies in how it impacts their products and services, how it changes their markets and their business processes, and ultimately how it will impact their productivity growth. Digitization also creates huge challenges for labor markets as many jobs and occupations are at risk are already being displaced. Now, some may argue that perhaps we are looking here at what may ultimately be a blessing in disguise. If we have fewer people available to do the work, let's call in the robots and other types of artificial intelligence and grow productivity that way. Unfortunately, that transition process is not easy. For example, we still need the complementary skills of humans. We need to bring the displays to new opportunities, and we need to improve our education system and um, um, uh, our education system and uh, to manage those large disruptions. And that brings us to a topic that I haven't, cons uh, haven't addressed very well so far. Who will benefit and who will suffer from those disruptions? Inequality has been a key aspect of any significant technological disruption. And there are no easy solutions to facilitate the transition or compensate those who are losing out. But the political and societal effects of ignoring them can be very large, and we are already seeing some of that. There's a lot to say about inequality, but to stay with my theme of the sources of economic growth, let me say just this. The unequal distribution of income and wealth amongst our citizens is primarily a symptom of a different degree of access to the sources of economic growth. Who has access to high quality and effective education? Who has access to health care and housing? Who gets access to the fruits of innovation that potentially can improve people's life? It is the quality of growth, rather than just the quantity of growth, that matters for redistributing the benefits. And indeed, when we're looking forward, I'm not going to pretend that growth projections, as we economists are doing, can deal with how the fruits of the growth are going to be distributed. But we can identify how important qualitative sources of growth are going to be for the global economy. Over the next 10 years of the 2.9% global growth that we may see in our models, about one percentage point will come from creation of human capital, innovation and digital transformation, and more productivity to free up the resources in order to improve people's life. It's a tall order to create at 1%. It's even a taller order to grow it faster and to double down in it to, uh, uh, to deal with the challenges of our global economy. So to wrap up, in my opening remarks, I stated that we have surprisingly well managed the challenges of the past decade. It could have been much worse. Still, among many policymakers and even many business leaders, we sense a fear of pessimism today. The recent shocks, political, economic, or purely modern nature, they make us concerned. We worry about government debt, about how technology impacts our jobs, how to deal with the aging of our population and environmental and climate change challenges. And there are even bigger questions about the future of our democracies and the vigor of our capitalist system. Sustaining capitalism has even therefore become the subtitle of this conference. But what if the glass is not half empty, but half full? To some extent that depends on our own mood, but ultimately it depends on whether we are able to turn the risks into opportunities. And the critical factor is the political and business leadership to do that again. I sincerely hope that today's meeting can help to improve our understanding of those challenges, and I commend the Circle of Empresarios for driving this agenda in the past, today, the next 40 years, and even beyond 2030. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bart. I mean, obviously, if we don't see the glass at half full, I mean, it's not a hope in hell that we'll have inclusive and wonderful sustainable growth. 
say let's let's see that glass always half full. I will now ask Inge Manaev, our first panelist, Vice President of the Circulo Empresarios, to make the first initial comments. Ingemar came from Sweden to Spain more than 30 years ago, and like many non-nationals, uh, was smart enough to make Spain this hospitable and beautiful country his permanent home, though I think his Spanish wife had something to do with it. Um, Ingemar told me the other day that, I mean, we've all got great ideas. Uh, the problem is how to implement them. Uh, you have the floor. Ingmar. Thank you. I, I will start by standing up and then I will, will sit down. Your Majesty, authorities, Chairman of Telefonica, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, obviously for me a great honor to be given this opportunity to address such a distinguished audience on our view, concerning our view on the 2030 scenario, or if you will, our vision for the, for, for the future. Thank you. And uh, then I will do that in two different parts, a little reflection on what has been said here about the change, the speed of change and the implications of change. And the other one will be a few words about the study that you heard that we, we presented yesterday. You see the video, the part of the message in more emotional terms. I think we have been moving from a very, let's say, planable, if you want, Cartesian world where you could predict the future better into a more Darwinistic world with all which that implies. And uh, I, I will say that uh, in the old world, from a business point of view, the size of a corporation was a competitive advantage. When you come into the Darwinistic environment, as you all know, it's not necessarily the biggest but the fittest that survives. So I don't think size is necessarily in all sectors a competitive advantage anymore. And that goes not only for, for businesses, it goes for persons, countries and regions. Those that are able to change fast enough to adapt to the fantastic opportunities but also threats will benefit and turn threats into opportunities and those that cannot do that will suffer the consequences because I don't think we can actually stop the present trends. Uh, having said that, then a few words about the study. As you heard, it's called the Better Spain for Everyone. And one of our key findings after some lengthy discussions, because we did start 18 months ago, and you might think that's a long time, <laughs> and it is, but during this time, the Brexit happened, we have a new president in the United States, we have a new president in France, so, so the, the, the pace of change is, is substantial. Well, the key finding really, in a way, is that uh, concerning what, what Tom mentioned, the what to do is very well documented. There are hundreds of meters of good studies concerning different future scenarios with good arguments, intelligent, knowledgeable people have spent a lot of efforts. So if we fail as a society, we will not fail due to lack of information. Uh, the how issue, it's the weak spot. The how issue, uh, with, uh, the what without the how, will not allow us as a society to, to advance. We will not reach our goals unless we are able to mobilize not only the brains of people, but also the hearts. This was the miracle that, that Spain performed 40 years ago, managing to engage a, a big social majority in favor of a political transition and then the integration into Europe. We would like to be the catalyst of repeating that fantastic achievement. It's not easy, but I think this is the challenge that, that we are facing. And we're doing that in an environment, I would only think, say two things, and the consequences of those. On the one hand, we have the digitalization, we have the uh, globalization, and we have the crisis, economic crisis, that we're coming out from now, at least on the macro level, which is good. But of course, in that process, we have left a lot of citizens behind. 
that are deeply frustrated, even angry. At the same time, we see that the social media that we have together developed are used to sell very simple solutions to extremely complex uh, problems. That is what we call the populisms. And there are different shades and forms in the south and in the north, and I will not go, go into that, but the consequence of the sum of the two is that I think in this moment the most precious gift or concept of democracy, which is the, the ability, the willingness to listen actively to people with different opinions, in, in my view, is in danger. And of course, being that so, that effectively blocks or makes it very difficult to engage in any type of productive, constructive, critical debate. And that is where, where we stand today. And just saying that in the study then, we have identified four key areas where we believe that Spain needs to sit down and reach the type of agreements with broad support socially and politically so we can stay the course long enough. And I'm not talking about two years or four years, not one legislature, several, to be able to implement with the expected results, whatever we agree on. And the four areas, just briefly, is uh, education uh, 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 aimed at supplying knowledge and skills that will be demanded in the future. It's not an easy task, but it's necessary. Quality employment, so that the companies can pay better salaries while still being competitive. And the only way to do that is to be more productive and have skilled, a skilled workforce. We have to uh, consider the, um, the welfare state, especially the birth rates are very, uh, 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 very low in very big parts of Europe and Spain as well. And the last one, but not the least one, is the quality of our institutions, and I will just mention one thing, that the rule of law is an absolute prerequisite to defend democracy. Outside the law there is no democracy, and inside the law, if you have the willingness, all problems can be solved. And of course the theme of this conference it will be the cornerstone, and, and it is the cornerstone also our little study, but of all other such studies, the cornerstone will be how to achieve the sustainable and inclusive capitalism. And those that are gathered here, the business communities representing many countries, I think this will be our main challenge uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ingmar. Our next panelist is Jose Juan Ruiz. Jose Juan is chief economist and head of research at the Inter-American Development Bank. He had a very distinguished career in Spanish banking before he moved to look at uh, the Latin American uh, issues. Uh, Jose Juan is a, is a policymaker's dream colleague because he has ideas as fast as he can talk and frankly Jose Juan we we miss you here and talk as fast as you want but uh, you and Ahmed have got about 17 minutes to share between you <laughs> if we're going to have a coffee break okay, okay. I'll try to do that thank you it's, my, it's an honor to be here uh, really an honor to be here and I would like to, to, to start picking up some of the methodology that Bart uh, did develop between shocks, trends, and disruption, and put these uh, in some way with some historical perspective. Assume that you have 100 countries and you have data for GDP per capita today, and you have for the same countries GDP per capita in 1850. If you regress, GDP per capita today with the old data, 160 years, you will discover something that is very scary. It's two thirds of the relative position of the countries is uh, completely account for the position they have 150 years ago. 
This is what with the economists call hysteresis. I call in a more poetic uh, try, try something that's persistence of infortune. Uh, the persistence of infortune is there uh, and maybe when we try to think about the future we, uh, we would like to concentrate, to focus our minds on what happened with the other one third. What explains the success? How you can escape from these long-term uh, long trends that has been developed uh, by, by that? And the first good news is, is Spain. It's uh, one of the countries that uh, escaped from this long trend. And we knew, and we know why and how Sp Spain escaped from that. Democracy, better institutions, better incentives, a stronger private sector, more human capital, more integration in the world. This explains our success. The second good news is that in the last two decades in Latin America, you are beginning to see half a dozen of countries that are trying to follow the same pattern. This year is going to be the 25th anniversary of the third wave of democracy and most of Latin American countries recovered democracy 25, 30 years ago. And this democracy, although if you focus on the shocks, you will see that there is a lot of problems, a lot of weaknesses, you, uh, if you are strapped from that and you look uh, in a broad view, what you will see is that democracy has allowed most of Latin American countries to reach agreements and to reach broad agreements, broad consensus on a very large uh, quantity of topics from fiscal reform, more investment in education, uh, from fight against the crime, opening to foreign direct investment, more integration. They are following, in some sense, the pattern that we know that works. And this, I think, it's a, is a very, very good news. The second good news uh, about these uh, half a dozen countries in Latin America is that they are building on success. The last two decades in Latin America has been much better than what happened in the 20th century. What we have, we have seen, an increase in GDP, that's true, but more important, we have been, we have been seen a decline in poverty. Poverty in Latin America today is 50% lower than 20 years ago. 50% lower. And Latin America, we are talking about inclusive capitalism, Latin America is the only area in the world in which the increase in globalization has been accompanied by a reduction in poverty, in, in, in inequality. And this is something that maybe raised some of the questions that you were raising. Why in Latin America populism is in reverse? Because policy design, Public policies have helped to compensate the loser of the globalization and to try to level in the playing field for everybody. This is still, there are a lot of things to do, but I think the progress has been very clear and we have to keep in mind of what is going there. In Latin America are happening things which go much beyond the things that you normally see in the newspaper, in the headlines of the newspaper. There is a very deep and very exciting chain and this chain is mainly made because in Latin America today, it's a region in which 60% of the population are middle class. And this middle class is pushing ahead the reforms, pushing ahead the improvement in institution, pushing ahead the fight against corruption, pushing, pushing ahead uh, the needs to have much better education, larger human capital. His Majesty has said something, and this is going to be my last remark, has been, uh, we have a challenge, we have to challenge how we, we, we find better employment opportunities and a better education. I will say that with the third disruptor that Ben uh, point out, the technology, these two things are not so different, His Majesty. Uh, we are going to live in a world in which technology is going to ask you to have education through 
all your life. The old world in which we spend one third of our life in primary school, secondary school, and the university, and afterwards uh, we don't have any formal education mechanism, is going to disappear. This is not going to happen. You cannot imagine that you are going to spend two thirds of your life without going back to a school without having a process to, 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 to develop new skills. And here the twist is going to be very important because you, entrepreneurs and, and, uh, and uh, company, company managers, uh, the ball is going to be on your field. The public sector is spending in Latin America today more in education than the Spanish government. Latin America is spending today 6% of GDP in public education. But this is not going to be enough. Uh, the, 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 the thing that we really need is that the companies develop schemes and develop training schemes to provide people who arrive to the, to the companies the right uh, skills to develop and, and being innovative and being as productive as we, we want. This is a new role for the companies. The, the new role for the companies is not just education. Companies are going to be asked, as they are now today, to foster integration. I cannot see the regional integration in Latin America, the expansion of Latin America to Asia, uh, to Europe, to Africa, without uh, granting the companies a much, a much bigger role. And of course, I cannot, uh, I cannot imagine Latin America uh, developing infrastructure just because the public sector is investing. And we need the private sector to invest in Latin America. What's, there are a lot of things which, are, which remains to be done, but uh, I think that the, 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 the future could be optimistic. I am going to finish just with uh, a sentence. We have good engineers, but we have much better writers. And if we want to escape from the pessimism, uh, I like a lot a sentence with, uh, written by Onetti. Onetti say, yeah, and I'm going to, 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 to tell this, this sentence in Spanish. Say so that la, la vida. Life is to escape from three geometric figures vicious circles, love triangles, and closed minds. I think that that's what we need in Latin America, and I think that that's what we're going to achieve. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jose Juan. That was great. Uh, and now our third speaker, our third panelist is, is Ahmed Buzwenda. I, I'm really delighted, uh, and I think, and I thank you, the the, the uh, Circulo Empresarios, for, for, for having Ahmed with us. Uh, I think he, his story is, is is a remarkable one. Ahmed is uh, an entrepreneur and a builder of teams, and he's the president of the Arab Institute of Chief Executives. I believe there are few people as qualified as Ahmed to talk about inclusive growth in North Africa and the Middle East, the need for strengthened institutions, and to set a framework for the challenges of immigration, uh, the challenges of integration between uh, both sides of the Mediterranean. Ahmed, you have the floor. Thank you very much. First of all, it's my honor to be here, and I'd like to thank uh, the Circle of Empresarios and his president, Osan, to allow me to be part of this uh, panel. I come from a part of the world uh, that has witnessed the major transformations, uh, namely the Arab Springs. I don't know if the spring is the suitable word for that when we see what's going on in the area. But it seems that uh, Tunisia is one of the survivors of this major uh, transformation. And um, I have to, uh, to recall that when uh, the revolution, uh, revolution showed in 2011, Tunisia has made an average growth rate of 5% in 10 years in a row, giving the praises of the World Bank, the IMF, the World Economic Forum, showing it as the most competitive economy in the world. And despite that, people was desperate. When these young guys emulate himself, he's showing a situation of uh, misery. When the population went to the street, 
at the beginning, they were not calling for democracy. They were not calling for freedom. They were calling for job opportunities. They are calling for better governance. They are uh, calling for less uh, corruption. <coughs> when then uh, what went wrong? A country that is doing 5% in 10 years growth, what went wrong? When we opened the book and tried to see what's, what's going on, we come out that this uh, quality of growth, and that's what I fully agree to as part said at the beginning, that the quality of gro growth is of essentials. We, we come out that this, our growth wasn't inclusive. Some coastal cities of the countries are making maybe 7 or 8% growth, on the main time, the inland cities are probably getting uh, poor. And uh, uh, the inclusive came, the inclusive new uh, growth models came uh, naturally. And uh, we said that now it's time has come to think of new economic models. The uh, democratic transitions went. I would say uh, move uh, forwards with uh, ups and downs, but in general it's okay. We are having, uh, we had free elections, uh, parliaments, which is really reflects the populations in which there is the, the lefts, parties, the moderate and centers, the Islamic parties, everyone is represented in the parliaments. The uh, institutions, the democratic institutions also are being set not completed, but it's, it's, uh, it's on the right track. So the uh, transition, the democratic transition is moving, let's say, on the good path. But the economics model, and here is our, our role as a think tank and private sectors, is try to explain to the policy makers that these new economic models must be of course, inclusive, but what does inclusive mean? Inclusive means that must benefits to these areas of the countries, must have the participation or give the opportunity to the, to the participation of everyone, and that uh, the private sector, and here is our uh, role, our, how we defined our role, is that the private sectors must uh, play a major role in, uh, um, in uh, designing this economic model. So some crucial questions tried, we try to ask our uh, policy persons, political persons. What the role of the state, for example? Is it, is it worth having a government or state still operating uh, uh, cement plants and uh, bar mills, uh, steel, steel mills? What's, what's the frontier between the public services and the role of the privates? What, uh, why having a lot of overprotectionism in our e economy? Let's have free economy. And when we're talking about free economy, and when you want to talk about jobs and growth, the private sectors are the best ally to make that, because the day-to-day -day, uh, thinking of most majority of us here as a business uh, uh, leaders is to think of growth, to think of hiring good people, um, the competent people. So we are the best allies of the government. So let's, let's listen to us. And we uh, try to transform our think tank as an advocacy to, uh, to, to call for these uh, uh, new economic uh, models, which is not the implementation now, because everyone agrees on, on the diagnosis, as Ignabar says. We know exactly what to, what to do, deep reforms of the financial sectors, because it's, we, we need the money to create companies and to make investments. We know that uh, we must uh, have, get rid of the uh, regulations, or so less regulations. We know that we must improve the professional training. Uh, we know that uh, we, we must have a tax uh, uh, reforms, or let's say being uh, business friendly. We know all that, but what the priorities? And here is the, the main challenges is how to make priorities of these reforms. We, we cannot do deep reforms, all these deep reforms at the same time. It's not going to be possible. We know that from our businesses that when you have many priorities, it doesn't, 
it doesn't it doesn't go well. Okay, so we, we try to make the priorities in order to to let the uh, political uh, um, persons, which I have to recognize, do not have a very deep, uh, with all of the respects of uh, politicians, uh, knowledge of the economies and how uh, how things can get uh, uh, built step by step. So this is the main challenge that uh, we have identified. We have identified some others also, which is the, let's say, the integrations between Europe and then I'm not talking about uh, regional area, R Europe, North Africa, Mediterranean area, and Africa. Because Africa, according to us, is no longer the continent of poverty, the continent of uh, conflicts. Now Africa, I think, is going to be the continent of uh, future, but it has many challenges. First of all, it's by 2045, the population will grow to over two billions. Most of them will be living in cities. Uh, the young most of them also are young and are connected and using internet devices and this of course will create uh, if it's not properly managed if it's properly managed it can be a positive force of change if it's not it will be real uh, uh, path for disaster so uh, you are talking in the presentation of the summits of moving uh, the uh, the center from uh, from the atlantic to uh, asia uh, i think that the, the the vertical access also will be of uh, interest thank you Perfect. Thank you very much, Ahmed. We could, we, could, we could really all go on all day and all night and all tomorrow. But unfortunately, uh, we have our time limits. Uh, and uh, I hope we've set the ball rolling in this panel for the rest of the summit. Uh, and uh, and I, think, I think the tent is well held down with such distinguished people with such wonderful ideas. I would ask you all to remain seated while His Majesty leads the way to the coffee break and, uh, and then you follow. Thank you very much indeed.